Hi, David. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another English class here on Verbling.com. My name is Lisa, and I'm one of the English teachers here at Verbling. And in this hour, we're going to be reading an article together about artificial intelligence, and we'll be able to discuss it as well, I hope. So if you have a reservation, of course, you can use the reservation now. If you didn't make a reservation but you want to join us, just wait a minute, and when you see the Join Class button, then you can click on it and join the class. It will open up another window for you, which is the Google Hangouts window, and you'll come in here with me and with David and other people who will probably show up here in just a minute. So how's it going, David? Fine. Uh, you look like sick, maybe? A little bit cold? Yeah, I've had a cold. Um for about two weeks now, but I, I feel okay, but my voice is still uh, not back to normal, so, no, and I, I, I talk a lot, so it's, that doesn't help. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, and how have you been? Uh, fine, this was my first week after three weeks of vacation, so, okay, it was breaking. <laughs> <laughs> It was okay. It was nice. It was quiet. So starting at fifty percent, yeah, my capacity. So it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> wow, three three weeks is a long uh, a long time to be gone. So it takes a little while to get back into. Yeah, yeah. we say uh, get back into the swing of things. Have you heard that before? No, I haven't. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you please type in the other chat. In the group chat? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, me, yep. There you go. Yeah. We should complain. I don't like this part of verbing. Yeah. Both have to be integrated in the same. Yeah, I know they're making some changes, like they just redesigned the the website. So I think every time they do that, they have a lot of things they have to go back and look and make sure it works. So the verbling chat is one of the things that uh, often fails <laughs> so but luckily we have the group chat so that usually works all the time with Google so that's good so um, I don't know we had a fully booked class but you know that you never know what that means I know there are some classes that are finishing up right now and sometimes it takes a little while for uh, them to finish and then come in here so why don't we go ahead and just talk a little bit before uh, we start the reading um, what do you know about artificial intelligence? Yeah, artificial intelligence is part, or at least I have a subject, I had a, a subject in my my degree at university because huh? at the end it's related to software. Yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence, or at least what I studied at university, is not, you know, Robocop or Terminator, no. It's <laughs> a way of programming. At the end it's a way of programming in order to make um, the software available to to learn by itself, but at the end it's a way of programming. Yeah. Yeah. The first day in that subject in class, the first told us, "Okay, artificial intelligence, not Robocop." No. So you have to learn that. Yeah. Because you don't, <laughs> you will, you will fail the exams. <laughs> so it was, it was very funny. It was a very, very interesting um, subject because at the end, uh, the teacher was absolutely right. Uh, there is a deep um, mathematics base on this kind of programming, mm -hmm. so it's very interesting in in a science the point of view of the scientist is very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. probably I would like the, the article. <laughs> okay, well let's see. Um, so let me just say hi to everybody and welcome. And um, I think we can go ahead and uh, get started. Let's see, some people are coming in. Maybe you guys were just in one of the other uh, classes that was finishing up. So let me put the article uh, that I have for us today in the, the screen share. Uh, this article is from Wired. Dot com. So Wired is a magazine here that is uh, pretty popular that talks about technology and business and cybersecurity and stuff like that. 
And so every now and then I go looking there to see if they have an interesting article that's maybe not too long that we can read together. So I found this one today, and it's called AI, which stands for Artificial Intelligence, has arrived, and that really worries the world's brightest minds. So uh, intriguing title there, and uh, we're going to read it together, and I put it over here on the document, which people have already been opening. So um, let me just quickly say hi to everybody. Hi, Leszek, and Fernando, and Elena, and Adrian. How are you guys? Welcome. Um, I think we should go ahead and get started, because it is a little bit longer, and it's, you know, it's a kind of a uh, scientific topic, so there might be some things that I need to explain a little more, and I hope we can have um, some time to talk about it because I want to know what, what you guys think about uh, the topic of artificial intelligence and whether or not it worries you. So that's kind of the idea of this article is that the world's brightest, meaning the most intelligent people, the smartest people in the world right now, they are uh, really worried. So not just a little bit, but the title put in that really there. And so let's see what they um, are concerned about. What are their concerns for artificial intelligence as it is being, you know, evolved and created and, and growing and increasing uh, it, the abilities, <laughs> the capacities of artificial intelligence. All right, so I'll read uh, one at, paragraph at a time, and then we will take turns reading and then go over vocabulary. Again, as always, if you have any questions, uh, just go ahead and make sure your microphone is unmuted, and then you can ask your question. You can also... Uh, I think maybe we should use the group chat because I think some people are having problems with the verbling chat. So if you want to put a question or comment or say something uh, while we're talking, you know, while I'm reading, you can do it in the group chat so everybody can see it. Okay, let's get started. Um, on the first Sunday afternoon of 2015, Elon Musk took to the stage at a closed-door conference at a Puerto Rican resort to discuss an intelligence explosion. This slightly scary theoretical term refers to an uncontrolled hyperleap in the cognitive ability of AI that Musk and physicist Stephen Hawking worry could, could one day spell doom for the human race. <laughs> okay, Tanya, why don't you uh, go ahead and start us off there on that paragraph. Your microphone is muted, Tanya. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Yeah. Uh, on the first Sunday afternoon of uh, 2015, Elon Musk took to the stage at a closed-door conference at a Puerto Rican resort to discuss an intelligence explosion. This slightly scary theoretical term refers to an uncontrolled hyperlip in the cognitive ability of L. V. Musk and physicist Stephen Hawking worry could one day spell doom for the human race. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, so we're just getting started here. So good, everybody has arrived. <laughs> um, okay, so artificial intelligence. All right, so they're at a closed door conference. So that's the opposite of open door. So if you have an open door conference, that means anybody is welcome. Anybody can register and come in and join the conference. But if you have a closed door conference or a closed door meeting, uh, something like that, it just refers to the idea that it's um, only certain people can be at this conference. So you had to probably be invited and very specialized type of people are allowed there, not just anybody off the streets. That's kind of the idea. And so they're not allowing uh, you know, just anybody to come into the room. So they're closing the door and making sure certain people can come in and others cannot. That's the idea of that uh, expression there, closed door conference. All right, so they're at some resort in Puerto Rico, and they're discussing, discussing uh, what they're calling intelligence explosion. So usually you think of explosion as like a bomb going off, but in this case it, it just means um, like a huge increase in intelligence and we're talking of course about artificial intelligence um, which we're gonna 
get into a little bit more. But that's the idea. So all right now, uh, we're seeing an explosion or an expansion or an increase in the level of intelligence. And um, this slightly, slightly just means like a little bit, <laughs> kind of a little bit scary theoretical term. Uh, that's what this intelligence explosion is, a theoretical term. Refers to an uncontrolled, so not controlled, so we have the un there, so uncontrolled hyper leap. A leap is like a little jump, but if it's hyper, it's like huge. So a huge leap in, or a huge jump or increase in the cognitive ability. So cognitive refers to thinking, so the thinking ability of AI, which is short for artificial intelligence, that Musk and Stephen Hawking are worried about. And they are worried because they think that one day this artificial intelligence could spell doom for the human race. So doom is like the downfall of the human race. So to spell doom, it means it means doom, or it means the end of the human race. So they're worried about this. Um, that someone of Musk's that someone of Musk's considerable public stature was addressing an AI ethics conference long the domain of obscure academics was remarkable. But the conference, with the optimistic title, The Future of AI, Opportunities and Challenges, was an unprecedented meeting of the minds that brought academics like Oxford AI ethicist Nick Bostrom, together with industry bigwigs like Skype founder John Talon and Google AI expert Shane Legg. Okay, hi Luis, you're next in the line there. <laughs> Uh, Luis, your microphone is muted. Hello. There you go. Hi, welcome. You can uh, read this Hello, paragraph. Yes. Yeah, that someone of Musk's considerable public stature was addressing an a, uh, AI, AI, AI? Mm -hmm. ethics conference. Long the domain of obscure academics was remarkable. But the conference, with the optimistic title, The Future of AI, Opportunities and Challenges, was an unprecedented a meeting of the minds that brought academics like Oxford AI ethicist Nick Bostrom together with industry bewilders. <laughs> Big like wigs, Skype, yeah. <laughs> big wigs, like Skype founder Jan Tallinn and Google AI expert, expert mm -hmm. Shane Lang. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, starting off the sentence, that someone of his uh, considerable public stature was addressed. So it's just a um, a, a different way to say it. it. You could have said it something like, "It was remarkable that." you know, Musk was there because, you know, something like that. But it's an interesting way they started. So the idea is they were kind of um, excited and kind of a little bit shocked that somebody like Elon Musk, who is a, a billionaire guy, who he's trying to build, you know, space stuff. He's into a lot of different uh, technologies, very uh, leading edge technologies. If you don't know about him, you want to learn more, you could just Google him and find out about what he's doing. But he's a uh, very kind of... Uh, a big player, let's say, <laughs> in the technology field. Um, so um, he has considerable public stature. Considerable means you know significant, and public stature means public popularity or fame, or he's like a celebrity. So a lot of people uh, know him in the public. Um, and he was addressing this conference. So addressing means talking to. He was giving a speech there. Um, and usually this conference is the domain of, which means the like the place where people who are obscure academics. An academic is like a professor, so they work in academia. And obscure means like not very well known, you know, not something that's very popular that people are talking about. So usually this conference is just filled with scientists who are uh, studying things that not very many people actually know about. So somebody who is this popular, this well-known, coming to this conference is remarkable, that he would be there addressing 
them. That's what the sentence means. Uh, remarkable. It's you know you take note of it. Um, okay, the optimistic title. So looking on the bright side of things, we say the opposite of pessimistic. So the future of artificial intelligence. Um, you know what opportunities and end challenges are there. This was an unprecedented meeting of the minds. Unprecedented means it hadn't happened before. So not precedented or not having happened uh, previous to this time. And the meeting of the minds, when great minds come together to discuss things, think about things together, we call that a meeting of the minds. And it brought together, again, academics, people in academia, from different parts of the world, so from Oxford, uh, this ethicist and author Nick Bostrom, and other industry, so talking about technology industry, and when we call somebody a big wig, we mean they're very high up. So they're um, really important people in an industry. They're called the big wigs. So somebody like Steve Jobs or um, uh, Bill Gates, they're the big wigs of you know computers, that type of thing. So we have the Skype founder and the Google AI expert. So all these people were there talking about the future of AI. Uh, Musk and Hawking fret over an AI apocalypse, but there are more immediate threats. In the past five years, advances in artificial intelligence, in particular within a branch of AI algorithms called deep neural networks, are putting AI-driven products front and center in our lives. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Baidu, uh, to name a few, are hiring artificial intelligence researchers at an unprecedented rate and putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the race for better algorithms and smarter computers. Okay, Legic. Musk and Hawking uh, fret over an AI apocalypse, but there are more immediate <coughs> threats in the past few years as well as uh, artificial intelligence in particular. Within, within a branch of AI algorithms called Deep Neural networks are putting AI driven products front and center in our lives. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Badoo, to name a few, are hearing artificial intelligence researchers at an unprecedented rate and putting hundreds of millions of dollars into the race for better algorithms and smarter computers. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so Musk and Hawking, these guys, they are uh, fretting over or they fret over, which means they worry. Another way to say it is, you know, what they're worrying about. So Musk and Hawking worry about or they're concerned about um, an AI apocalypse, so the, the artificial intelligence taking over the world kind of idea. Um, but according to this author, there are more immediate threats, so things that could be more threatening right now, so more immediately, so not necessarily in the future 50 years, but you know, right now. And that is that um, in, the past, in the past just five years, there have been a lot of advances in artificial intelligence. And especially with some algorithms, um, these are some uh, mathematical you know, equations and things that are related to deep neural networks. So neural refers to, like in our brain, we have neurons and things, that's our neural network, but I guess there's something that's happening in the artificial intelligence, like a brain, <laughs> that's uh, being created, and they're, you know, it's getting better and better in terms of learning. I think that's what's happening. Um, and so what's happening is they're putting these AI-driven products. So it means a product like a robot or something, which is controlled by artificial intelligence, driven by artificial intelligence. And these things are becoming front and center in our lives. So if you put something front and center, it's like right in front of you. It's important. It's being used. That's the idea of front and center. And uh, there, these all these uh, technology corporations are hiring these researchers at an again unprecedented rate, so faster than ever before. And they're putting lots and lots of money into the race. So the race between the you know the different corporations to try to find better algorithms and make smarter computers. So the industry is driving this type of um, 
research. AI problems that seemed nearly unassailable just a few years ago are now being solved. Deep learning has boosted Android's speech recognition and given Skype Star Trek-like instant translation capabilities. Google is building self-driving cars and computer systems that can teach themselves to identify cat videos. Robot dogs can now walk very much like their living counterparts. Okay, Fernando. Okay. Right there. AI problems that seemed nearly unsociable just a few years ago are now being solved. Deep learning has boasted boast Android speech re recognition mm -hmm. and given a Skype Star Trek like instant translation cap cap capabilities. Capabilities. Mm -hmm. Capabilities. Google ah. is building self driving cars and computer systems that can teach themselves to identify cat videos, robot <laughs> Those can now well very much like their living counterparts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So um, these problems that seemed, you know, we thought they were nearly, you know, pretty much unassailable. So you know, not being, we couldn't solve them just a few years ago. We couldn't deal with these problems. Uh, they were too hard to attack. Uh, now they're start solving these problems. So this idea of deep learning is what they're calling it. Um, it has boosted. Boosted means has improved. So Android has a speech recognition. So it recognizes speech, uh, which means it can understand speech. Um, so that is you know has improved. It has bo been boosted. Um, and also Sky uh, Skype has a new uh, instant translation capability. So the ability to the the power to be able to instantly translate, you know, if you're talk talking on Skype, now you, you know, they'll hear your voice, recognize your voice and change it, translate it. So that's kind of what they're working on and it's happening more and more. Of course, uh, I've already done classes on the self-driving cars. We've talked about that and seen how those are working. Computer systems are teaching themselves <laughs> to identify things like cat videos and even robot dogs are more and more like their living counterpart. So the counterpart is uh, the real dog. So the counterpart to a robot dog. It's like the, the thing that it, uh, it represents. Okay, things like computer vision are starting to work. Speech recognition is starting to work. There's quite a bit of acceleration in the development of AI systems, says Bart Selman, a Cornell professor and AI ethicist who was at the event with Musk. And that's making it more urgent to look at this issue. Okay, Elena. We have two Elenas, so the first Elena. <laughs> Next to Fernando. Mm -hmm. Elena Vise. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Elena? Your microphone uh, is mute. There you go. Uh, me? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> uh, things like computer vision are starting to work. A speech uh, recognition is starting to work. There's uh, quite a bit of acceleration in the development of uh, AI systems, says uh, Bart Shellman, a cor Cornell professor and um, <laughs> AI, AI. Yes, <laughs> AI ethicist who was at the event uh, with Musk. And that's making it more urgent to look at this issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just more things are happening, you know, accelerating the learning, uh, computer vision, computers can see, <laughs> There's, that's starting to work. Again, the speech recognition, so recognizing people's speech, their voice, what they're saying. Uh, there's quite a bit of, so a lot, that just means a lot of acceleration. Acceleration is when you speed up, you're going faster. So you know, as they're learning more, it's just going faster and faster. It's accelerating um, in terms of the development of these systems. Um, so Cornell, that's a university here in the United States. He's an ethicist. These guys are people who, uh, you know, talk about the ethics 
of artificial intelligence, which means, you know, the rights and the wrongs and why, you know, can we do this, should we do this, what are all these things that come up for people. And so he, there are people called ethicists who have that discussion. So he's one of them. Um, and he's saying it's making it more urgent. If something is urgent, it means you must talk about it now. It's really important now that you uh, deal with this or you look at this issue. Uh, given this rapid clip, Musk and others are calling on those building these products to carefully consider the ethical implications. At the Puerto Rico conference, delegates signed an open letter pledging to conduct AI research for good while avoiding potential pitfalls. Musk signed the letter too. Here are all these leading AI researchers saying that AI safety is important, Musk said yesterday. I agree with them. Okay, Elena S. Given this rapid clip, Musk and others are calling on those building these products to carefully consider the ethical implications. At the Puerto Rico conference, delegates um, signed on open letter pledging to conduct AI research for good while avoiding potential pitfalls. Musk signed the letter too. Here are all these leading a AI researchers saying that AI safety is important. Musk said yesterday, I agree with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So given this, or you know, based on the fact that there is this rapid clip, clip means the speed of something or the rate, and so it's you know it's accelerating. We just learned that. Um, Musk and others, so other people as well, are calling on. When you call on people to do something, uh, it means you're asking them. So I'm calling on you to help or something like that. I'm asking you. And so he's calling on these people who are you know, researching and building these products. What he's asking them to do is to carefully consider, to think about the ethical implications, the, the ethical uh, issues that come up when you build these type of products. That's what an implication is, like the issue or the what you have to think about when you're um, building such products. Okay, let's see. The delegates, those are the people that are at the conference, the people that were allowed to go to the conference. They all signed an open letter. So um, an open letter is like a letter that goes out to the public. And so it's showing the public that all of these people are pledging, which means like they're promising uh, to conduct their research or to do, to perform their research for good. Because obviously this could be used for bad, as we know, like in different movies and stuff like that. <laughs> Avoiding the potential pitfalls. A pit pitfall is a is a problem. You know, something that can come up and and cause problems. So they want to avoid these potential or possible problems in the future. And so you know, a lot of people are saying this is really important, and Elon Musk agrees with them. Even Google gets on board. Okay, nine research for researchers from Deep Mind the AI company that Google acquired last year have also signed the letter. The story of how that came about goes back to 2011, however. That's when John Tallinn introduced himself to Dennis Hasbis after hearing him give a presentation at an artificial intelligence conference. Hasbis had recently founded the hot AI startup DeepMind and Tallinn was on a mission. Okay. Just from Google gets on board. David. David, there you go, yeah. yeah I'll read it. <clears throat> Google gets on board. Nine researchers from DeepMind, the IA company that Google acquired last year, have also signed the letter. The story of how that came out goes back to 2011, however. That's when Jan Tal introduced himself to Dennis Hassavis after hearing him gave a presentation at Artificial Intelligence Conference. Hasabis had recently founded a, a hot AI startup, DeepMind. Tallinn was on a mission. <laughs> OK, good. So Google uh, gets on board just means that they're joining in. So the people at the DeepMind, uh, which is now a Google company because it was acquired. So when a company acquires 
another company. It means they take over, they buy that company, and now it's it's part of the Google a group of companies. They also signed the letter there, uh, but that's another story, and it goes back to uh, 2011. So when you say goes back to, it means that's when it started. And they met. Uh, let's see. After hearing him give a presentation, he introduced himself. So that's how uh, they met. Um, Hasabas has recently founded the hot AI startup DeepMind. All right, so that's when this happened four years ago. To found or you know to be the founder of a startup is to be one of the people who creates the startup. A startup is a new business, uh, very popular nowadays in technology. Verbling is like a startup business, um, and so to be on a mission means you're after something. You're going after a goal, and so Talon was on. A mission. Let's see what his mission was. Uh, since founding Skype, he'd become an AI safety evangelist, and he was looking for a convert. <laughs> the two men started talking about AI, and Talon soon invested in DeepMind. And last year, Google paid $400 million for the 50-person company. In one stroke, Google owned the largest available talent pool of deep learning experts in the world. Google has kept its deep mind ambitions under wraps. The company wouldn't make Hasabis available for an interview. But DeepMind is doing the kind of research that could allow a robot or a self-driving car to make better sense of its surroundings. Okay. Amparo. Since founding Skype, he had become an AI safety evangelist, and he was looking for a convert. The two men started talking about AI, and Talin soon invested in DeepMind. And last year, Google paid for hundred, no, four hundred, yeah. uh, four hundred million no, million for the fifty-person company. Mm -hmm. In one stroke, Google owned the, the largest available talent pool of deep learning experts in the world. Google has kept its deep mind ambitions under wraps. The company wouldn't make Hasabis available for an interview, but DeepMind is doing the kind of research that could allow a robot or a self-driving car to make better sense of its surrounding. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as we can see, he's been on a mission. <laughs> uh, his mission was to be a, an AI safety evangelist. Usually we think of the word evangelist in related to religion, like a, a person who is a religious evangelist wants to uh, share their religion with everybody and preach about God or something. But in terms of this, uh, if you're an evangelist for uh, something, it just means that you support it. So he's a, an AI safety evangelist, which means he's going around and telling everybody how important it is uh, to look at the safety of artificial intelligence and how we're going to use this technology. And so he was looking for a convert. A convert is somebody that uh, converts to your religion <laughs> or that converts to your um, whatever it is that you're supporting. So he's looking for somebody to also join him in this uh, uh, discussion about AI safety. That's kind of the idea there. So they started talking about AI and then uh, Talon, he soon invested in the DeepMind company and then Google bought it. So they acquired it and they paid $400 million for a small company, 50 people or 50 person company. Uh, this is an expression here, in one stroke. It means in one stroke of the pen. So they, when they signed the paperwork to buy the company, that was like a stroke of the pen. And that means in one stroke, just signing the documents they owned now, the largest available talent pool. So. In, Talent means, you know, of course, the researchers, the scientists, and the pool means the group. So now this company, um, DeepMind, is basically the largest group of people who know a lot about this deep learning. They are the experts in this uh, particular subject area. And so uh, we don't really know what they're doing because Google has kept. That means they're, you know, they're they're maintaining. Uh, secrecy basically they don't know we don't know what their ambitions are what their goals are what it is that they want to do with their research they're keeping it uh, this is an expression to keep something under wraps so to keep it secret is what it means so they're keeping it very 
secret, under wraps. You could also say they're keeping it hush-hush, which means nobody's talking about it. So we don't really know. And um, they wouldn't make this guy available for an interview, so we, we didn't, the article, you know, the, the author of the article couldn't uh, find out <laughs> what they're doing. Um, but we do know they're doing a bunch of research regarding robots and self-driving cars. And the idea is, the idea of intelligence is to learn. So they're being able to actually learn about the surroundings. That's why the Google cars can be self-driving because they can pick up, you know, other cars, other obstacles, things like this. Um, that worries. And, uh, Lisa. Yes. Um, I have a question. A yeah, sure. grammar question. Uh -huh. um, they are said uh, for the 50 person uh, yeah. company. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you say 50 people or it has to be person there because well. It's an adjective, uh, so... Yeah, it's an adjective describing the company. Um, 50 people company. It's probably better to... You could say 50 people, but it sounds better to say 50 person. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It wouldn't be totally incorrect to say 50 people. I said people. So usually when you talk about plural, you're talking about people, but this is 50 person. It kind of goes along with the same idea when, uh, when you see, like... Uh, when uh, he is a 12-year-old yes. boy, that kind of thing. We don't say 12 years old boy. Yeah. So yes, the word acts yeah. like an adjective. So exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank exactly. You. Good, good eye there. Okay. All right. Um, that worries Talon somewhat. Okay. What worries him? Uh, the fact that they're probably under wraps and that this is what they're doing. <laughs> they're learning. So this worries uh, Talon somewhat. It means a little bit. In a presentation he gave at the Puerto Rico conference, Talon recalled a lunchtime meeting with Hasibis, um showed how he'd built, uh, where Hasibis showed how he'd built a machine learning system that could play the classic 80s arcade game Breakout. Not only had the machine mastered the game, it played it, I would say, with a ruthless efficiency efficiency that shocked Talon. While the technologist in me marveled at the achievement, the other thought I had was that I was witnessing a toy model of how an AI disaster would begin, a sudden demonstration of an unexpected intellectual capability, Talon remembered. Okay. Uh, Adrian. That worry Tallinn somewhat in a presentation he gave uh, he gave, had, gave at the Puerto Rico conference. Tallinn recalled a lunch and meeting where Hadis uh, showed um, how he built a, ma a machine a learning system that could play the classic uh, 80s ar archive game breakout. Not only had the machine mastered the game. It played it with a uh, ruthless uh, efficiency that uh, shocked Tallinn. Uh, will uh, the technology in my in my mark at the achievement of the other thought I had was that I was uh, witnessing a toy model of how an I I disaster would would be begin a sudden demonstration of an unexpected intellectual capability. Uh, Tallinn remember. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you are somewhat concerned, somewhat worried, it means you're a little bit, you know, <laughs> not totally, you're not, you're, you're not freaking out yet, but you do have some concern. So he gave a presentation, a talk or a speech at the conference and he recalled, which just means he remembered, he was thinking again about um, a meeting he had with Hasibis and he had been showing him that he had built a machine. So this was a machine that was a learning system and it could play this uh, 80's arcade game. I don't know if you guys remember Breakout. If you don't remember you can look it up and she'll, it's a very simple game but uh, the idea was that the machine had mastered the game. So he became an expert at the game, the computer playing the game and he played it with ruthless efficiency. So it was extremely efficient, like a human being probably couldn't be as efficient, and that shocked Talon, so that surprised 
him. Um, even though he is himself a technologist, so he loves technology, and of course he marveled at, so use the express the preposition at, to marvel at something means to be amazed at it, to be like well, shocked and like wow that's cool. Uh, so he of course thought it was really awesome, but on the other hand he also thought he was witnessing or seeing or observing a toy model, okay, so a small model of just how a disaster, an artificial intelligence disaster would begin, how it could start. And this was a, a sudden demonstration. Demonstration is an example, or when you show something, how something could happen of an unexpected. So they didn't realize this could happen. You know, this is the idea of artificial intelligence getting out of control we, unexpectedly. So that's uh, kind of shocked him, surprised him. Deciding the do's and don'ts of scientific research is the kind of baseline ethical work that molecular biologists did during the 1975 Sal Salomar Conference on recombinant DNA, where they agreed on safety standards designed to prevent man-made genetically modified organisms from posing a threat to the public. The Asylumar conference had a much more concrete result than the Puerto Rico AI confab. Okay, Tanya. Okay. Deciding the dos and don'ts of scientific research is the kind of baseline ethical work that uh, molecular biologics did during the 1975 SLMR conference on recombinant DNA where they agreed on safety standards designed to prevent man-made genetically modified organisms from posing a threat to the public. The SLMR conference had much more co concrete results than the Puerto Rico all confab. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so deciding uh, the do's and the don'ts, okay? So what you can do and what you shouldn't do or won't do and what you won't, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing. So that's you have to talk about that when you're talking about scientific research, and that uh, creates a baseline ethical work. All right, so they did this. The baseline is like the base, the bottom, kind of like where we're going to work from. And so the molecular biologists, they were doing this back in 1975 when they were talking about taking apart you know, DNA and uh, changing the DNA and how they could work in the lab to change things. Um, so they were agreeing, or they agreed, using the past tense, they agreed on safety standards that were designed you know, so that they were created to prevent man-made you know, people, scientists, <laughs> creating these GMOs, we call them now, genetically modified organisms, from posing a threat, so from causing a threat to the public, to the world, basically. Um, this sentence here is making the statement that this conference in 1975, they had much more concrete results. So they basically, a concrete result is more like telling you exactly what you can or you can't do. So maybe at the Puerto Rico conference they didn't get to that. The CONFAB is just like a private uh, conference discussion, a meeting, something like that. So their results weren't as concrete in terms of what you can do or what you can't do. At the Puerto Rico conference, attendees signed a letter outlining the research priorities for AI, study of AI's economic and legal effects, for example, and the security of AI systems. And yesterday, Elon Musk kicked in $10 million to help pay for this research. These are significant first steps toward keeping robots from ruining the economy or generally running amok. <laughs> okay, Luis, you're back. Uh, you can read that part right there at the Puerto Rico conference. Okay, teacher. At the Puerto Rico conference, attendees signed a letter outlining the research priorities for EA study of EA's economic and legal effects. For example, in the security of EA systems, and yesterday, Elon Musk kicked in 10 million to help pay for this research. 
These are significant first steps towards keeping robots from ruining the economy or generally ruining Amok. Amok, yeah. Okay, so the attendees, those are the people attending the conference, the scientists, the researchers, and again, they signed the letter, and the letter outlines. To outline means it details, so it, it, it talks about the details about research priorities, so what is the most important thing we should be researching right now, that would be the priority uh, for AI, so artificial intelligence, AI. Um, also, they're talking about studying, you know, the economic and the legal effects. So what does it mean, you know, for the economy and also for laws related to, you know, public laws and things, um, and also security. So that's a really important thing um, of the AI systems. Um, and Elon Musk kicked in, and <laughs> that's an expression we use, to kick in a certain amount of money. It means to, you know, he gives that amount of money for something and so in this case it's to help pay for this type of research about the safety of the uh, AI systems and you can use kick in a lot like hey can you kick in five bucks we're gonna buy uh, our boss a present or something like that so it means can you give so to kick in a certain amount of money means to give uh, some money for something um, these are for significant first steps so you know the things that they're doing right now they're just the beginning steps the first steps uh, toward <laughs> keeping the robots from ruining the economy. Uh, a lot of people think that if robots take over the economy, nobody will have any jobs. So how are we going to make our money to live, that kind of thing. So that would ruin the economy. Or just generally running amok. So to run amok means to run around destroying things, kind of to be out of control. Uh, sometimes we talk about like little children, they're running amok. It means they're just running all around, kind of messing things up. They're out of control. You know, parents aren't paying attention, that kind of idea. So you can imagine what would happen if the robots started to uh, rule the world kind of thing. <laughs> uh, but some companies are already going further. Last year, Canadian roboticists, ClearPath Robotics, promised not to build autonomous robots for military use. To the people against killer robots, we support you. Clearpath Robotics CTO Ryan Garpy wrote on the company's website. Okay, Legic. But some companies are already going further. Last year, Canadian robotic, uh, Robotics uh, Clearpath Robotics promised not to build autonomous robots for military use. The people against killer robots, we support you. Clearpath Robotics C uh, CTO Ryan Jerip wrote on the company's website. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So they're going further. That means they're already, you know, kind of uh, we say policing themselves. They're already taking steps to make sure that it's safe. So um, the pronunciation here is roboticists, so it just means a person who works in robotics with robots and things. Um, they promised not to build autonomous robots. Autonomous means that they act by themselves. They don't need a human being controlling them. So and, um, they don't want to make these. They're called killer robots. So people are against those, the you know, using those for the military use where you could just send a bunch of robots into a place and kill a, kill people or something or take over. Um, so we support you, so they're not going to do that. And CTO is just the for a chief technology officer. So that's what that means there. Um, pledging not to build the Terminator is but one step. AI companies such as Google must think about the safety and legal liability of their self-driving cars, whether robots will put humans out of a job, and the unintended consequences of algorithms that would seem unfair to humans. Is it, for example, ethical for Amazon to sell products at one price to one community while charging a different price to a second community? Okay. Uh, Fernando. Fernando, your microphone is muted. There you go. Okay. Uh, Starting from pledging. 
pledging not to build the Terminator is but the one step. AI companies such, uh, such as Google must think about the safety and legal liability of their self-driving cars. The <laughs> robots will put humans out of a job and the unintended consequences of algorithms that will seem unfair to humans. Is it, for example, ethical for Amazon to sell products at one price to one community? Will charging a different price to a second community? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's put that there. All right. Um, yeah, so pledging not. So remember they signed the letter. They're not going to do certain things. That's so a pledge is like a promise. So they're not going to build Terminator. <laughs> That's one step. That's one thing that they can do. But, you know, there are other concerns. They have to think about safety and legal liability. Liability means what you're responsible for legally, um, you know, in relation to their self-driving cars and whether or not robots will put humans out of a job. So if, it, if, you, if something puts you out of a job, it means takes over your job. So a robot will come in and take over your job and you won't have a job. And also unintended consequences. So not intended, which means you don't think it's going to happen. You're not expecting it to happen, So, but it does. A consequence is like a result uh, of something that happens. So of these algorithms that they're making, this would seem unfair to humans. So do we want to put ourselves out of <laughs> out of use, basically, by creating robots to do everything uh, for us. What are we going to do? That's kind of uh, one of the the things people are discussing. Um, and then here's the example of: Is it ethical? Is it you know morally right for Amazon to be able to to do this? And that they would do this by figuring out you know in their algorithms, figuring out one product you know is one price for this group of people over here and the other group of people they have to pay a different price is that fair to people uh, what safeguards are in place to prevent a trading algorithm from crashing the commodities markets what will happen to the people who work as bus drivers in the age of self-driving vehicles Itamar Arell is the founder of Benedix a deep learning company that makes trades on the stock market he wasn't at the Puerto Rico conference, but he signed the letter soon after reading it. Okay, let's make sure everybody has a little bit to read. Elena. Uh, me. Okay. Yes. What uh, safeguards are in place to prevent a trading algorithm, algorithm from crashing the commodities markets? Uh, what will happen to the people who work at as bus drivers in the age of self-driving uh, vehicles. Mm -hmm. Itamar Arel is the founder of Binatix, a deep learning company that makes trades on the stock market. He wasn't at the Puerto Rico conference, but he signed the letter soon after reading it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so what safeguards? What are what are the safety measures that people are putting into place, you know, putting making happen so that we don't have uh, these <laughs> algorithms crashing our commodities markets? Commodities are things like uh, uh, sugar and beans and pork and like the day-to-day -day things that are traded on the markets, uh, you know, and what's going to happen to people's jobs, you know, like if you have uh, self-driving vehicles, automobiles, buses, cars, trucks, things like that. What will happen to all those people who now work as uh, drivers, for example? Um, but we already have it happening, so another deep learning company. So deep learning means artificial intelligence that can learn to do things on their own. They don't need humans uh, to program anything else. The program learns. That's kind of the idea. Um, and so he also signed that letter. Uh, to him, the coming revolution in smart algorithms and cheap, intelligent robots needs to be better understood. It is time to allocate more resources to understanding the societal impact of AI systems taking over more blue-collar jobs, he says. That is a certainty in my mind, which will take off at a rate that won't necessarily allow society to catch up fast enough. It is definitely a concern. Elena S. 
to him the coming revolution in smart algorithm algorithm algorithms mm -hmm. and, and cheap intelligent robots need to be better understood it is time to allocate more resources to understanding the, so the societal uh, impact of uh, AI systems taking over more blue collar jobs. He says, that is a certainty in my mind which will take off at a rate that won't necessarily allow society to catch up fast enough. It is definitely a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the coming revolution, it is coming, it will be here in the future, in the near future, where we will have <clears throat> cheaper, more intelligent robots, um, and so we have to try to understand this, what, you know, people, a lot of people don't even know that this is happening right now, uh, but scientists are working on it, um, it is time to allocate more resources to, to allocate resources to something means to, to spend uh, time, money, uh, uh, intelligence, your resources to understand something, to give more resources towards a certain project. In this case, understanding how it's going to impact our society, societal impact. How is, you know, are these, how are these systems going to impact or influence our our lives, basically, our society. Um, a blue collar job is like a manual labor job, like in a factory or something. Um, a white collar job is where you sit in at a desk and you're a professional. Uh, so robots are probably going to take over a lot of blue collar type jobs, and um, they think it's going to take off at a rate, you know, at a speed that won't necessarily allow us, allow society to catch up fast enough. So we might not even realize what's happening and it'll be too late kind of thing. So that's definitely a concern, a problem, something to worry about, something to think about. Um, predictions of a destructive AI supermind may get the headlines, but it's, but it's these more prosaic, i.e. worries, that need to be addressed within the next few years, says Murray Shanahan, a professor of cognitive robotics with Imperial College in London. It's hard to predict exactly what's going on, but we can be pretty sure that they are going to affect society. Okay, David. Sorry, predictions of a destructive AI supermind may get the headlines, but it's there more prosaic. A worries that need to be addressed within the next few years, says Murray Sanahan, a professor of cognitive robotics with Imperial College in London. It's hard to predict exactly what's going on, but we can pretty sure be pretty sure that they are going to affect society. Mm -hmm. So uh, predictions of something. When you predict, it means you you kind of guess what's going to happen in the future. So of course, when you see headlines, headlines on the newspaper, on the websites, things like that, that talk about a destructive AI supermind, like some some kind of you know supercomputer that's going to take over the world. Of course, that gets a lot of attention. But what this person is saying, these more prosaic, so these kind of more mundane, everyday. Uh, commonplace AI worries, the things, that's what we really need to think about or address in the next few years. So it's not the big taking over the world kind of thing, but it's just these every little, everyday things that are probably going to take over the world a little bit slower and not so, um, uh, you know, not such a big thing, but everyday people might be losing their jobs that kind of idea. So uh, that's hard to predict, you know, it's hard to know exactly what's going on because like the deep mind company, it's under wraps, you know, we don't really know what they're doing with this technology, uh, but we can be pretty sure, so we can, you know, understand and basically know that we are going to be affecting our society. People are going to be affected by this technology, this um, artificial intelligence. Okay, we don't really have time to talk. Uh, Amparo, since you didn't get to read, what did you, what do you think about robotics taking over jobs and, and everything? Well, I think that uh, the, it's going to 
it's going to happen but uh, i think that they cannot be perfect like a human being can do a, a job uh -huh. it, uh, they can replace in some uh, uh, in some uh, places uh, steps on, on in a company but uh -huh. not in, uh, in every uh, single uh, position Aspect. at, the, at uh -huh. the company yeah mm -hmm. yeah Yes, so that uh, remains to be seen, I guess, because <laughs> some people are worried that uh, some of these computers are actually more perfect than humans. <laughs> so, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, really. But um, definitely something interesting. Uh, if people are interested in this topic, definitely click on some of these links. Find out who Elon Musk is and uh, this other guy. The, I forget what his name is. He has a book called Super Intelligence. If you want to read about this, uh, I think his name was Brotham or something. Uh, anyways, he wrote a book about this. So definitely something to be um, paying attention to in the future. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I'm going to do a speaking class about this. So I think we need time to discuss, and I want to hear what people think about this. And um, Elena, I'm sure you have a lot of things you could uh, say re from the philosophical point of view of uh, AI. <laughs> sure. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it'd be interesting. Okay, guys, have a great weekend, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. 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 B